like for trans for ecosocial transitions and popular from, from the grassroots. And so it, this was all being done in a way that wasn't really connected. And so it was within this context, which is when the Ecosocial Pact of the South came about. And that was also where we would like to focus our panel today. And we're going to do it as follows. So we're going to begin hearing from Enrique Viale, who is going to be giving us a broad idea of ecosocial transitions, looking at the different north-south dynamics, how those um, transitions in the north are really hegemonic, and also proposing a series of challenges for the global south for Latin America and see how this new liberalization that has to do with its corporate, its, its with privatization, how that affects the south and oftentimes promises false solutions at the expense of the south itself. And Ricky Viales, um, a lot of people here know him. He is an environmental attorney and um, has really um, been a, a companion here on many different eco-social fights in Argentina and throughout Latin America. And um, recently, I'm sure you've seen him on the, heard him on the radio. We're really happy to have you with us today. And once we hear, uh, we will start um, talking about just uh, transitions and also with the eco-social pact the South and also throughout Latin America. And so this means opening ourselves up to this whole scenario of uncertainty, of conflict, but also this, you know, wide range of different struggles that we've seen over the last couple of years to really find trends and um, learning that we can get out of that. And so after that, we are going to be happy to hear from our uh, colleague, Esperanza Martinez. Esperancia is a very valuable um, person that we have in Ecuador. She's a biologist, she's an attorney, she's the co-founder of Way Watch Network, and also of the, of, she's also from Acción Ecológica in Ecuador. After we hear from that context and taking it into account, it's a geopolitical context in, that we have here in Latin America, that Kiko and I are gonna talk about, Esperanza is gonna talk to us a little bit about some specific proposals that we have from the Ecosocial Pact of the South, trying to connect them to different practices, different experiences, that are going to help us to move forward on the issue that we are looking at here at this um, at this summit, which is to build an eco-social world. And so, least but not, last but not least, we are going to hear from Miriam Lang. Miriam is an intellectual and activist. She's German, but she's been living in Quito for the past couple of years. She's a teacher um, at the Simon Bolivar Indian University, and she there coordinates a very interesting master's degree program, which I'm sure many of us, uh, many people who are here today would be interested in. It's about um, development alternatives. And so we are going to be showing this whole new eco-social world that the summit is talking about, which is a new world that's not far away, but it's something that already exists in these different experiences with different forms in different territories. And Miriam is going to close out our panel today by providing with us with certain challenges that we really need to take into account to continue moving forward toward eco-social um, changes that are going to be just and um, with the grassroots. And so that's the menu we have today. And we are going to be getting, um, getting started with Enrique Viale. All right, go ahead. Hello and good afternoon. Here in Argentina, it's afternoon. So I'd like to say hello to everyone. I'm really happy to be part of the Social Pact and to be with you here today. It uh, makes me very happy. And so um, those of you who wanted to hear from Marista Lavampa, who's a very amazing colleague of mine, um, a lot of the things um, that I'm going to say have to do with reflections that she's made. So you will be, um, have her with you and to a certain extent. And so we do believe that this has to do with um, oil and fossil fuels. Um, I mean, it's not an easy task, especially when we're talking about climate change and the preservation of life and the planet demands it for us in, in a very urgent way. But we also have talked about her that what the issue here is to begin to do a cultural battle to start to um, get out of the culture of oil and not to go deeper and so to begin a just 
a transformation that is fair to everyone in our territory. So from our perspective, an ecosocial transition needs to be understood in terms of social changes that are profound and that go across every aspect of life in, in a social economic regime, regime change. And so this is a change with a bunch of different um, issues that we have to look at it and also implies not um, having a separation between the social and the natural system. And so to move from an anthropocentric view to a biocentric view that really questions the separation between social systems and natural systems. And in addition to this, and this is something that's really important, especially when we talk about the region where we are in Latin America, when we talk about eco-social transitions, it, we're not only talking about energy transitions, but also a productive um, transformation of um, everything that has to do with development that have been imposed colonially in our region. And so it's not just a change of source, but rather a change in the social system and the connections to nature. The issue here is not just to do decarbonization and to move away from fossil fuels, but rather the idea is to change the, the productive model, which is agribusiness, mining, um, oil, gas, which are totally not sustainable. And so a socioeconomic um, transformation is a horizon that's really broad and it's something that should lead us to look at some really radical questions about what kind of society do we want to live in? What kind of, uh, what I mean, what is it that we're proposing for the future? But, you know, fundamentally here, the, you know, the, the, the core of our position has to do with the fact that we cannot, again, allow Latin America or the global South, not only Latin America, to once again be a place of sacrifice. In, or, or a new altar when it comes to the energy transition of the global north. Because the truth of the matter is that in Latin America, what it is that we're seeing, that we're not seeing any sort of energy transition, but rather an expansion, an energy expansion. It, more fracking, more you know hydraulic um, operations, more offshore production. And there's uh, you know dozens of uh, projects in the... Um, of oil extraction in the global south, more projects to um, feed the overconsumption of the global north. And so we continue being used by the north while co energy colonization moves forward in under what we could call a corporate transition, an energy, corporate energy transition, like uh, the lithium that we see in northern Argentina or the north of Chile or southern Bolivia where we have a lot of lithium and which is so essential for um, for electrical car batteries. So again, this is an area that's being sacrificed so that every American can have their electric Tesla. And then, um, you know, what we're going to hear from Esperanza, which is um, the cutting down the balsa wood in, in Ecuador for the wind um, energy industry or the progress of, of, of mining, not only for lithium, but for other minerals that are needed for solar panels or for um, wind farms. And so meanwhile, the governments in the South are competing between each other to get international contracts to produce and export hydrogen, which is the new gold and the new El Dorado which is um, which which served as this idea of when we talked about an imperialistic um, advance and so all of this expansion and this and corporate energy transition does not take into account uh, energy sovereignty in in this global south, in a world that's living in, in a global crisis, in a deglobalization, nor social license facing the destruction of territories and criminalization that's growing throughout um, with the different mega projects or the local impacts. And again, Latin America is the place where we're seeing a lot of sacrifice. And like I've said before, all in name of the energy transition. And so the truth of the matter is that there is no transition this, you know, the, the idea of an energy transition and eco-social transition is in dispute. We have got to dispute it. And so that's what our group is trying to do. Because there's not just one, but several. One that's just of grassroots, that's been planned with the people on the inside, with the different workers. 
and we also see you know this corporate and market forces that are also playing and so the risk here is that when there is this acceleration of the roadmap when it comes to psychosocial and um, global we are seeing is that the governments and the corporations of the north are the ones that are pushing it forward and for a transition of the market where among our own peoples and our own territories and of course nobody's you know stupid here nobody's we're not talking about an eco-social transition or an energy transition that's linear nor or if we're talking about an acceleration of inequalities destruction of ecosystems and so but the truth of the matter is that what we have to do here is see what's going on and we've got to really warn people about what's happening about this corporate transition that is trying to impose its own mission on the energy transition there are many different stakeholders that have to do with this you know climate change the different international agreements and the different decisions that states are taking in different corporations look at the energy transition as a new way for them to accumulate wealth and to have have more geopolitical hegemony. And so this vision is very much connected to corporate environmentalism, which is something that definitely exists, and where we can also see the technocratic uh, theories that come into play. And so that's where this whole capitalist idea, vision comes together that's trying to save capitalism without questioning the idea of infinite growth where you always find some sort of um, narrative to continue with this idea of um, as if, if this were actually possible to continue of like infinite growth. But from a business perspective, from a corporate perspective, there's, you know, there's different issues, not only when it comes to multinational countries, but all companies, but also the different organizations that we have at the national level, especially when we're talking about the global north. And so in this framework, the issue is controlling access to energy, and technology. So a working group that is led by Mars de la Svanpa about energy talks about a defossilization and hegemony. And so there is no, you know, we're not talking about the limits here with this model transition. It's so corporate, it's, it's mercantile, and it really turns the entire world into an open pit mine, you know, not only lithium, but for other minerals that are needed to, for the corporate transition, which is really winning the day. And so this is a really short term transition. When you think about it, it has no future. It's new green colonialism, which, um, you know, generates this, this difference between North and South and it generates ecological debts. It's a really uh, vicious circle, the ecological debt uh, inequality that we have between the things, the different responsibilities when it comes to global climate change. It's made worse with the solutions that are being proposed here. And in a report by the World Bank, which is called, you know, an environmentalist um, report that the production of minerals by May of 2020, that minerals like um, cobalt and graphite could increase 500% in emissions would need to be increased by 500% by 2050 to be able to meet the needs. And they will need more than 3 billion tons of minerals, metallic minerals, for all of these different alternative energies and also just for storing energy to be able to reduce um, the climate, uh, the, the global warming by less than two degrees. And so just to close out here, because my 10 minutes are running out, in the, the media, we're also having this idea of corporate transition, this vision. It has to do with the business that can be business opportunities. The media looks at Latin America at least as a source for government and corporations, and they give no voice to activists, to anybody else. It's all very biased. And so if you look at a study by Climate Tracker organization, which has studied for many months the different Latin American media and how um, the economic and corporate um, vision is seen in this um, energy transi transition. And so we've seen this in many different um, countries and of the main uh, sources of media. And so since, you know, one of the problems here is that we don't have um, specialized journalists, but the main source of, of 
of information are, are the national governments and representatives of the companies. There is no scientific information, or community leaders, or any folk focus on environmentalism and poverty. And so in summary, our idea here um, that we have with the Ecosocial Pact is related to the critical vocabulary that we have in Latin America that's related to um, our territory and you know criticizing this this neo extractivism and, and taking advantage of our territories um dialogue ecological transitions energy transitions something what we want is a transition that is going to be fair and something that is going to help the grassroots thank you thank you very much and kike for you know setting the stage here latin america the global south and this um these um, ecosocial transitions that we have in these disputes about energy transitions and also to really dispute this idea of the corporate transition so like i had said before i'm going to talk a little bit more about latin america specifically and you know kind of open the stage here so that Esperanza can also talk a little bit about um, certain proposals that we have and experiences that we have related to um, these fair transitions within Latin America. So um, following what uh, my friend said, I'm now going to pass the floor to myself, who, you know, I'm the, also the monitor here, but I'd like to talk a little bit about this. So, um, you know, real quickly, I would say that we are living in Latin America over the last, you know, couple of years. What we're seeing is an acceleration um, that's really strong, that's really, really um, marked by two major critical events. The first one was the pandemic, but with certain specificities as far as how the pandemic has really deepened the deterioration of living conditions. But the second element that I want to point out has to do with how this acceleration is also connected to an effervescence and you know these social uprisings that have implied protests, protest um, throughout many of our different countries over the last couple, two or three years. And I think that this is something that we're gonna see are gonna get more and more important. And so the idea that we have here on the table is this idea of the people that are just, you know, they're, they're done with this and this urgency with this unstable reality and we can understand as, you know, and something that we just can't continue for the majority of the people that live just can't continue like this. And so two special points that I want to make about this is that I think that these, you know, uprisings that we've been seeing over the last couple of years have really, we're talking about a new moment of struggle. This is a new time of struggle, which is different from what we've seen in the past for a couple of different reasons. And I would say that I think that um, these um, uprisings have come out of, you know, something that's really complementing the less visible struggles that we see in the different territories. And so there's something that's really interesting here. And I think that is that based on this feeling of like, of, like I just can't take it anymore of these uprisings that make them more and more there becomes with this you know awareness social and politically speaking of the majorities about the urgency of really taking on this from the grassroots level when talk, we're talking about all the different eco-social challenges that we have in the world today oftentimes i think that a lot of um, critics say that these protests protests are just you know are all about opposition but that's where it starts because behind one there's besides that no there's a lot of yeses and so, you know, you've got this popular rejection of neoliberal policies and anti-democratic governments, like right now what we're seeing in Ecuador, but also it can serve for the action of the different um, popular movements in, in a general terms, because behind no uh, ag to agribusiness, no to mining, no to fracking, there are proposals and there are alternatives that are being uh, put out there. So I think that these uprisings have also worked as good um, social thermometers. They're like symptoms of the illness that we have at this time. And we've seen it in different cases over the last couple of years and moving from, you know, this, this, this bad feeling to these political alternatives. I mean, it's really obvious. We see like lots of different options available. We've got seen come countries where you've had these uprisings over the last couple of years. And in some cases they removed governments in others, what we've seen is that they really strengthened the repressive dynamic of the governments that were already in power. And then in others, we saw that they pushed forward changes 
and, and you know social policies like what we're seeing especially when we talk about chile and also in colombia regardless um, this gives us a certain level of hope thanks to the social um, demonstrations but latin america is really going to have to you know be reconstructed at this really difficult time and right now nato is meeting in madrid and they're trying to generate you know this new consensus about um, the war and global militarization and beyond all of these different um, corporate transitions that we have that we have heard of, about from kike we're seeing an element you know of really um you know military idea when it comes to the the whole world we've also seen a deterioration of um, living conditions we have an um, increase in inequalities hunger a reduction of human rights um, which are being broken on a daily basis and what we see in that scenario is a major crisis a profound crisis that many of these social movements and social environmental movements have made it to that they need to be defined as a eco-social crisis in a civil in a crisis of civilization and so that's why we have this importance of finding a just transition. And that's why we have the importance of the ecosocial pact of the South, as opposed to hegemonic transitions that Kika talked to us about, the proposals that we have for ecosocial transitions that are just and um, popular are something that are really coming together as a, a civil, an, an alternative of civilization, something that's both integral and integrating. And so this idea of a sociological transition is nothing new, but I do think that it has gained force over the last two years. And I agree with Kiki on that, but I think that we're talking about two society elements that are very well installed in our um, society that we have, you know, this difference between uh, social and social issues and, and, and nature issues. I mean, those need to come together. So what we want to do is really insist on the fact that these are inseparable. These are two things that cannot be, the environmental and social issues cannot be separated from each other. And the importance of understanding our interdependence, our eco-dependence in the face of this idea of a constant separation between nature, social so society, culture, nature, and so that's why this idea of proposing the eco-social and eco-socialism as, as, as a new future is something that we're talking about, a multidimensional view of a transformation, not only that comes from socio-environmental movements, but, a, you know, this idea of a societal change. So second challenge that we have here in, in, in just social, socio-ecological transitions is this idea of, you know, we have this, this, this very short-term thinking. So while we do have this corporate agenda, which moves toward decarbonization by 2040, 2050, and so on and so forth. But today what we're seeing is this idea of, of you know, short-sightedness. We all want immediate answers to the problems that we have. And I think that in eco-social transitions that are fair, what we're trying to do here is to talk about just how important it is to coordinate different time periods and to resist the short term um, thing, but also to, to you know, to, to sow these different opportunities for the medium and long term. And so to this effect, and just to continue, you know, moving on to a final reflection, what I'd like to do is propose the following. Today in Latin America, we are living a reorganization of the left. And this reorganization of the left is something that it goes through the centrality that eco-social transitions are, are gaining over the last couple of years. What we've had are different, you know, different, really, really diverse ideas about the different political disputes in Latin America. On the one hand, we've got the authoritarian right wings, and then on the other side, uh, progressivism, those perspectives that are progressivists that want to go back to um, you know the government and so I think that these two elements are you know they're there they haven't left the scene but what we want to do in a really interesting way in the last less than the next couple of years is um, to you know go deeper and have a reorganization of the left that are really challenging the progressivisms that are classic over the last century but are also challenging progressively all of the different ideas about what you know the authoritarian right is and so obviously when we talk about from an institutional and state point of view we think about the experiences that we've seen in chile and colombia so chile with their um 
with their constitutional assembly, the new elections and everything that's happening there when we talk about the rights of nature and progress toward an ecological constitution, the campaign that Pedro had, um, which has an ecological transition plan and has really insisted on the centrality of socio-environmental justice and defense of life. And it's really clear that the future of Petro government and the one that we have in um, Chile, they're obviously very different. However, what I would like to point out here is that this is just the visible side of an iceberg, right? And so what we can see here are the boards and the future Petro government is this is the visible side of an iceberg that is being redefined and reorganized in Latin America. So those administrations are only there because there was a push from society that's anti-elitist and anti-liberal. And they're there because grassroots and socio-environmental movements have really pushed toward that direction. And that has to do with this reorganization of the left. A reorganization that implies a political experimentalization and not only with these electoral victories, but also with a series of initiatives of the, the peoples, of, of, of the youth, uh, feminists, indigenous, the black, um, that are all pushing toward these systemic transitions and eco-social transitions. So this is a progressive movement. I think that's, you know, it can't be stopped. And when we're looking at ways that we can find responses to the problems that we're facing today and can also be connected to a specific um, specific changes. And um, Esperanza is going to tell us a little bit more about that right now. All right. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I want to repeat a few things that were said. It, effectively, the Ecosocial Pact is an um, opportunity for coordination. It's an agenda, and it's a pact that specifically looks to declare um, nine specific points that I'm going to put together into three different groups. And I'm not trying to, I'm not naming them in order of priority, but these nine proposals were discussed you know, regional context, trying to recover some of the expressions that we heard from the social movements and some of the proposals that arise out of these discussions. So this is a proposal that, like Breno says, it's ecological and promotes um, social justice and promotes um, redistributive justice in, in an interwoven way. And so I'm going to start with those that have to do with care. Because if we take into account the fact that, like Breno said at the introduction, we came about at the time of COVID. And so we kind of came about with this idea of how the idea was being taken down on the fact that you could not stop the market, that machinery of capitalistic um, accumulation couldn't be stopped, but they did activate that, you know, emergency break. And so what we learned, unfortunately, the cost of dependence, but also we're really excited about the fact that in many of the different actions that were taken which to take care of life, that was outside of the different um, capitalist proposals that were made, you know, empty supermarkets, but the but in the, in the in the countryside, everything was fine. And the hospitals um, were collapsed. But everybody who, but everybody within their communities was was dealing with with health issues. And so when we talk about the the protests that we're seeing right now in Ecuador, there's a campaign of gratitude for everybody who works in the countryside. I'm thinking the women and also the proposals, which, as we've said, these are things that really make us reflect on these different changes when we try to. Um, redistribute priorities. And so the ecosocial pact, when we talk about care, we have one um, proposal, which is a recreation, the creation of national systems and local systems of care. And so basically we're talking about public policies that are going to connect care with social protection and that are going to have the ability to meet the needs of elderly persons, people who have who are dependents like children, also people who have disabilities, severe disabilities, and also individuals that cannot meet their own basic needs. And so we propose policies uh, for national governments, but also an agenda with local governments. And so we are basing ourselves on a new, uh, a basic paradigm of care, uh, talking about the person, their family, the community, but also protects the mountain, the river, the forests, uh, human beings, and also non-human beings. And so we have, you know, we're, we have this agenda of caring for life. 
And so when we talk about care, another proposal that we have talks about prioritizing um, food sovereignty when we talk about decentralized, autonomous, and healthy ways that are for people, for, for country, for, for, for people, and which involves the entire productive system. And so when we talk about this, we've had a lot of experience with this in Latin America in Latin America. And when we talk about fishing, we talk about urban areas, we talk about everything and all different levels. We do have networks of distribution of seeds to ensure that they can be um, distributed. So these are a lot of little efforts that we've had. They're not centralized, they're not organized, but that doesn't make them any less important. They have an inspiring potential, but also because these have been experiences of ways where we can have decentralized and flexible networks and also place the importance of territoriality and the importance of scale. So in addition to this agenda of care that we have from the pact, there is a post-extractive agenda. And so when we talk about post-extractivism, the pact, what we do is talk about the necessity of reconstructing um, societies in a post-extractive world with this radical eco-social um, transition that Breno had talked about, proposing a, an organized and progressive exit from this dependence on oil, on coal, on gas, and on mining. And we do it because we think, we believe that it's not just a proposal, it's an aspiration of desires that we have and also urgencies. And because it's something that is possible, it's viable. And that's why I also wanted to mention a few of the experiences that make it possible for us to propose to see how it is possible to have that construction, that exit from extractivism. And so I think the Yes Sunni proposal was a specific proposal that um, came from the government. I mean, it obviously failed for, for different reasons, it was connected to a compensation to leave the oil underground, but later it was um, retaken um, by, the, by the people as a democratic exercise where all of society wanted to make decisions and establish priorities. And to be able to demonstrate the fact that what is nat the national interest? Is it economic or is there an, in uh, an interest that is always that becomes more and more central and has to do with the, with the life of, of the people's nature that has to do with a small scale things? And in Ecuador, obviously, you know, that process has of um, a referendum when it comes to the SME is still on the table. Mm -hmm. And so there's been a lot of, you know, things that we've learned in these different territorial scenarios. And I would say that, for example, in Costa Rica learned why they didn't want um, to have oil, you know, with these different exchanges that we had with Ecuador, with oil watch. And so the people, the indigenous peoples and the urban populations and youth and women have made a lot of different visits to Ecuador to see what oil activities meant. And they chose uh, to stop it before this activity began in their country. And in Ecuador, we've also learned from mining and visiting Pasco, Aruro, and now what we're trying to do is to avoid these mining activities coming to Ecuador. And so all of these different um, referendum processes that we've seen over, uh, for example, what we saw happen in Colombia. And so what I'm trying to say here is that a large part of this learning is a learning that's a South-South learning process of the different experiences that each one of these countries has had and that they're starting to see, you know, certain changes. So, for example, in Colombia has proposed a moratorium on fracking from a national level in Argentina did this also in on certain local matters. And so this is an agenda that appears to be very complex. And so this time has been named as being one of oil civilization to that effect. We see the difficulty of getting out of it, but what we're seeing here is that it is being, um, you know, in, like rooted as seeing some of these things are, are very local, but it's something that we, we are moving forward on it. And so if we look at this post-extractive agenda, the pact is also incorporating different elements that have to do with climate change to be to work on this matter, not as units of carbon that need to be controlled, ish, um, you know, emissions and a trade with all of these different blue or green models that Kika had mentioned, but rather to propose how this um, is going to be, how we're seeing all these different disasters that have happened that are called natural disasters. But the truth is, is that these are because of political and um, issues that 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 were reported at their time. And so we see that this results in floods, 
uh, landslides and different ways to remove people from their lands because mm -hmm. that's what we're seeing is that these climate um, catastrophes um, we call hills of um, removing people from their land. And so if we look at these anti-extractive centers, there's other issues that have to do with um, defenders of territories. And so these are some of the scenarios that we've been seeing where we see a high level of, of criminalization or criminalization that's very aggressive, at least on our continent. It's not an exclusive thing because there's a lot of a criminalization on things that have to do with urban occupation or agro-industrial issues, but the expansion of the, the oil and, and mining borders is something that we see that, that, that go hand in hand with this criminalization because there are a lot of different communities that are fighting for to maintain their forms of life. And so this is where one of the other purposes of the pact has, which is to work on autonomy and sustainability of local societies to, prom to promote auto determination and protection of the different territories and the lands um, and the, in the, then these urban and scenarios, but also things that have to do with autonomy and sustainability at, at, at the more urban level. And so to this effect, I think that there's been a lot of different experiences that talk about, and for several years have talked about um, municipalities and cities as, as areas in dispute to be able to find other ways, other forms of life and other ways of life, like we've seen in Chile or uh, the, the Muchos um, project in Belo Horizonte in Brazil. So these are different places where we are talking about ecosocial transition. It's not exclusively talking about the rural areas, but also talking about scenarios that are in urban areas that incorporate different mobility plans that apart from, you know, bicycles, public transportation, um, the dignified housing, it's shorter uh, marketing supply chains, all of these kind of things. And so all of these different, these are these all local initiatives? Yes. Could they have a national projection? Yes. And that's what we're seeing. And um, uh, many of the other uh, the proposals that we have within the pact is looking at a uh, sovereign and, and, and global discussion. And while we do put a priority in self-south, um, connections, but also to move toward some frank and profound um, discussions between the North and the South. And we're trying to promote a strategic deconnection between the dynamics of the market and to really reconnect at a more local and regional level. And to this effect, there have also been a lot of different experiences that have been really important. And we've seen that these are now, you know, they're bearing fruit. And there's a bunch of different ideas that we have here from the pact that have to do with more structural and economic issues. And that's where we come with these different debts. So the pact that we propose is a solidarity, is a solidarity tax system. So whoever has more pays more and who has less pays net plays less, but they're in solidarity because those who have more pay more, but everybody has the right to be protected. And so this need of um, tax changes has a lot to do with the recognition of the fact that many of the projects and the different activities that are being imposed in our different cities and our different territories are not, don't just pay taxes that are proportional to their earnings, but also live in impunity. And so we're also proposing here in the pact, um, eliminating foreign debt and building a new financial architecture at the global level. And so the idea here is to cancel foreign debt for countries in the global south, which has been a proposal that's been gathered up by the conference of the United Nations about um, trade and development. And we've also seen something that came up by Ma Macron and the, the Pope. I mean, it's not in, it, a totally non-real option. So it's something that is on the global agenda. And in effect, we have this as a first step for historic reparations, which would allow us to put um, in the discussion uh, this idea of a debt between the North and the South, a colonial uh, colonial debt about inequality. And this is uh, part of an agenda that has been uh, impulsed by many different organizations throughout Latin America. So the pact also proposed proposes a universal basic income, which is not something that's impossible to be applied. And it's been proposed as a basic condition for rebuilding the relate the relationships and overcome this extreme vulnerability that we've seen. It's something that's been recommended by the ECLAC. And it's very much aligned with this idea of um, distributing different 
um, conditions and formal employment and also um, it's, it's, it's care. And this has a lot to do with the different issues that we had talked about at the beginning of the conversation. And so, and the lastly, we have a proposal that is very much aligned with the idea of looking at the historic way that, uh, that we live together and uh, to have uh, more opportunities for learning, for communication, so that within our societies, we need to find each other again as a society. And so this is a proposal that here at the Ecosocial Pacts of the South, we've been promoting in the different scenarios of the Latin American South-South, the world South-South, we're in dialogue with Africa, with Asia, but also North-South and talking about these different futures and finding how some of the things that we have look to be very green, they really aren't, and some of the things that look to be really economic oftentimes have um, a very ecologic um, content and they're very poetic and have a, a really spiritual context and so the idea here is kind of to locate ourselves as Reno had said in the different eco-social proposals can't be seen as in, in a fractionalized way and so you know to look that it's just either ecological or social but we need to put it all together with love with spirituality with poetry with imagination thank you very much Thank you, Esperanza, for that amazing mapping out of different practices and ideas and proposals and experiences. And with that, we are going to continue with, um, we're going to hear from Miriam Lang. Thank you very much for this opportunity, for having invited us to share. And I'd like to really focus on several different challenges that we have come across in our different debates with um, different regions and different stakeholders throughout the world in this agenda that Esperanza uh, just outlined. And I'd really also like to focus on three different um, challenges. Um, first are related to specifically the connections between the North and South and the different Souths. The second is related to what I called And then the other ones are related to the role of the state and public policies. And so, so as my first point here, I'd like to point out the fact that there are several different um, difficulties that we have in strengthening the North-South relations and also South-South relations when it comes to these different horizons of uh, transformations. And so I just want to point out the fact that here I'm using the idea of the Global North and the Global South being very aware of the fact that we're talking about a simplification and where the reality in and of itself is obviously much more complex. And so when we talk about North-South relations, we see that the Im images that we see in, of each other are very, you know, flat. I mean, the North looks at the South as an a homogenic, a poor that needs help and development, while the South sees the North as countries that are homogeneously rich, where everybody has the best life and where supposedly everybody's happy. And they ignore, they mutually ignore the profound inequalities and um, social contradictions that exist in each of them. We can also see that, as Enrique said, the different discourses about um, energy um, transformation ignore the fact that we live in a globalized economy and that any decision that is made in one region of the world necessarily ha is going to have impact in our different regions. And so looking here to see that with much facility, how, just how easy it is to look from the north and they just assume a continuity of a colonial relationships in which the different regions of the south need to comply with the role of being suppliers of raw materials for the transition of the north. They don't debate the different consequences of what this will have in social and environmental terms that will be consequences not only in the countries of the global south, but also definitively will also affect the, the entire planet because we live in an interconnected ecosystem, but in the different disputes that we have among the different Norths against the different negationist, um, the, the, the climate change deniers, what we find is that there are, it's almost politically unpresentable. There's things that can't even be mentioned when we talk about the different, um, to defend the interests of the different South. 
And this happens because the main dispute here is focused on, on one side, proposals that talk about moving toward a green capitalism that's based on technocratic solutions and um, positions on the other side that do want any changes and want to continue with the dynamics of the brown um, market that we've seen, which has led us to the situation that we're living in today. Both of these positions mean a continuity of this imperative of unlimited economic growth, as we already heard from the people who talked spoke before me, which is an aggravation of the global climate crisis. And it would appear that the way we're going here is this future of looking at different islands of decarbonized economies in a world that outside of these islands is um, it pre pre pretty much handed itself over to, de to um, devastation. So what we have to see is make the South visible when we talk about this Northern um, transition, that these are regions that also have the right to their own transformation in their own on their own terms. And so this is a huge challenge. Also, in terms of South-South relations, there are challenges that are very major for us in Latin America. The greatest challenge it comes with a linguistic um, gap because um, English is the lingua franca, is not something that most of the organizations in the South are able to speak. But there's also another factor that we could call um, as this um, policy of, a, of knowledge because in a Eurocentric world or perhaps a North centric world, it's almost impossible to have access to intellectual production from Africa or from Asia when we are talking about Latin America. And so this interregional knowledge between the different um, struggles and the different groups that are working toward as a just social socioeconomic um, transition of each continent in the South and the dial dialogue between the different Souths are very difficult to generate. But we do have, we are making progress. We do have um, experiences that we are amplifying. The second and very important point, which really makes it complicated to move forward on building eco-social transitions to the effect that Esperanza has um, mentioned has to do with what I call epistemic, um, generalized epistemic violence. And with that, what I'm talking about is, is systematic devaluation of alternative experiences from the different canons of valorization that are hegemonic in today's world. With, as we heard, Sosa Santos, there's a whole series of mechanisms to invisibilize, to devaluate or negate alternative experiences that exist. And generally speaking, these are called uh, marginal, irrelevant, as backwards, not modern, as that they come from ignorant and unprepared societies, or that they're like residuals, that, that they come from the past something that's a past that should be um, eliminated. It cannot be remediated or they're just written off as being only local, which makes them impossible to implement at a larger scale and makes them irrelevant. So facing this, what I'd like to point out is that these experiences are generally um, play at different scales and that are not just local. And so some of these we've seen examples for many other different cases, which in this idea of territorial expansion have been multiplied in the geographic, um, geographically, and adapting to socio-historical um, contexts that are very different. And so it's not an idea of just making, you know, uh, replications and others of these experiences have really been pushed forward from the local areas. And it have had an impact, for example, this initiative of the ITT, which was trying to leave the oil underground here in part of the Ecuadorian Amazon rainforest. And these have had impacts that have also inspired other, other struggles throughout the world. So there have been this has been this, you know, conceptualization of the fact that transformation needs to be taken to relevant scales from at least to the national level and generally from um, from the top to the bottom in order for them to be successful. So when we look at things this way, this stops us from seeing really just how the wide variety of these different experiences that we have underway in different areas of the entire world, where it's necessary to really look at everything and strengthen and interconnect all of these ideas. 
So it's to this effect, what we really need is to have a cultural change that would imply and mean, you know, we reconstructing this hegemonic vocabulary that are really focused on what we call the scalability of size. Here we're always talking about mega projects that being the most important thing to a concept that's really closed off about who it is that have valid understanding and who are the ones that are competent to really push forward the necessary transition and that also grants a role to this effect that is more and more important in the different um the large corporations it's also focused on giving an example an important role to profitability and then finally the different languages of valorization that do have a certain you know they have a real bias when they talk about when we're talking about is innovation or technology and then finally, as a third point that I'd like to mention, we have challenges as far as how we conceive the role of the state and public institutions in this ecosocial transition. So in Latin America, the debate has been very much polarized, as Breno mentioned, between those of us who want the state to be the, the, the central player to this transformation that needs to be designed and executed from the national scale as a progressivism, and those of us who are looking at the state as being an obstacle and, and, and a threat to the transformations that are happening locally and territorially speaking. So what we believe is that it's urgent for us to really look at the complexities of all of this. And there is no doubt that the generation of the different public stru uh, structures and also, you know, the, the free um, services that we have to be sure that we have real um, equality. And so as Maranza already mentioned that we do have public transportation systems, electrification, for example, these, you know, train systems that have been created in the different, um, you know, municipalities like, like in La Paz. These are examples that we can look at. The debates not only in Latin America, but also in Europe, for example, continue to be very much um, connected to this classical model of the welfare state that came about in the, the 60s and 70s. So these welfare states, however, are not, not that they don't exist in any part of the world. If we really look after decades of neoliberal reforms and austerity, but also to to a good extent, they were responsible for the huge rates of economic growth that took us to the local, the, the, to the global environmental crisis that we're living today. And so this is something that shows us that what we need to do is to rethink the role of the state in other terms, a role that has to do with regulations, yes, with establishing minimum amounts and maybe maximum amounts when we talk about um, the wealth, cons uh, consumption, um, environmental pollution, instead of um, imposing these ideas of self-government and both in the countryside and in the and in the in the cities, but also to strengthen them through regulations. So we can imagine this interweaving of institutions that are really going to safeguard these processes of transformation that are underway to protect them so that they can be co-opted, um, to keep them from being co-opted, but from um, corporations and mega projects. So what we need are institutional pro um, policies that are going to move us towards other areas of, so of sovereignty and not just, you know, a partial sovereignty, but a food sovereignty, energy sovereignty, health sovereignty, and that really push forward regional economies that are complementary to each other in the context of what Esperanza mentioned about a regional integration that's really transforming at the Latin American, for example, scale. So public policies that would facilitate interconnection and an enriching experiences of eco-social transition. Instead of seeking out homogenization of all the different um, processes under certain criteria that are unique and of standardization, that no matter how much attention that they might have, which I'm sure has been very well thought out of generating greater impacts, end up oftentimes leading to violence about different um, socioeconomic biophysical and cultural um, issues that really characterize Latin America. And so this is where I'm going to stop. So thank you very much. Thank you, Miriam, for proposing this whole series of challenges that are so important. And I think that, um, you know, have to do with all of the previous um, 
speakers and really leave us um, thinking about the central aspect of connecting different scales in time periods, cosmovisions, you know, and so I think that a global summit like the one that we're at right now with this main uh, purpose of generating a global dialogue, I think that with this panel, I think that we have, you know, a sampling of the fact that sociological transitions that are that are just and popular, I mean, they're already underway in Latin America and they have a diversity in a large amount of, of, of richness. And so like Kike mentioned at the beginning, it doesn't necessarily have to do with just an element of the energy transition, but rather it's a project for society or like Esperanza said, has to do with disputes of different, you know, giving meaning to life. So we don't have much time here for this panel. We've already run out of time. And so I'm really sorry because we're a little bit delayed in getting started. However, I really do hope that you and on, that all of us can continue having this dialogue over the next um, four days of this global summit of the different people, something that's really important so that we can really move forward together and in this um, toward a future of ecosocial transitions that are fair and um, at the grassroots level. So um, from here, for those of us at the Ecosocial Pact of the South and the Flaxo, and we're really happy to have been with you today. Thank you very much for having connected with us and those of, those of you who are, who are connected from all different parts of the world. And we're going to continue here. We're going to continue moving forward. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Kike. Thank you, Esperanza. Thank you, Miriam. I don't know if you want a quick flash of, you know, a final word. Maybe we only have just a minute left. Esperanza, did you want to say anything? No. I think everything's been said and it's been an amazing opportunity. Thank you very much. Let's hope that this summit also helps us to interweave better South-South relations between the different process that are already underway. So this is an invitation from the Ecosocial Pact of the South. It's an invitation to interweave and to connect, to really dream together and move forward toward a world that is going to integrate all the different dimensions of justice. So with that, we're going to stop. And with this open invitation to continue working together and to continue our path together. Thank you, everyone, very much. Have a great afternoon or evening or morning. <laughs>